Okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Those uh, minutes are approved. Thank you. We do not have any public hearings um, this evening, so we'll move right on to potential action items. And our first action item is uh, number C1 on the agenda, Yelcrest Harvard Heights Local Historic District. The chair recognizes Charlie Luke. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the zoning map to establish the Yale Crest Harvard Heights Local Historic District. Second. There's a motion by Council Member Luke and a second by Council Member Mendenhall. Any discussion to the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries and it's unanimous. Thank you. We are on uh, item, item number two, two which, which is, is a rezone, rezone of 1932 North, 2200 West, and the chair recognizes Council Member James Rogers. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move that the council adopt an ordinance amending the zoning map for the parcels located at approximately 1932 North, 2200 West Street from AG2 to BP. I further move the council adopt a legislative intent initiating a review of the zoning map for properties located on 2200 West between North Temple and 2100 North to consider rezoning those parcels to M1 light manufacturing. The intent is for the administration to review the current zoning to determine if rezoning these properties to M1 light manufacturing would be more appropriate and help maximize economic development along this corridor. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Rogers and a second by Council Member Kitchen. Any discussion to the motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think I'd like to address this just briefly. Yes, please. Uh, the reason for the language intent for this, the legislative intent, is that we have property. It's right next to the airport. It literally abuts the, the airport, and we are not maximizing opportunities for economic growth there. We're going to continue to have uh, entities come in and apply for a rezone again and again and again, and this is a way for us to spur that so that we don't have to do this every single time. Any other discussion to the motion? I'd just like to thank our chair, Mr. Rogers, for thinking, for having the foresight to look at this. And I think that this area of town needs the economic investment, and I think that this can really drive that. So thanks for uh, noting this. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries, and it is also unanimous. Thank you. Uh, we are on to item excuse me, on to item D, um, questions to the mayor from the city council. Um, <laughs> welcome. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'm not a very good stunt double, but I'll be willing to entertain any <laughs> questions. I have a question. I do too. Uh, okay, we'll just go right in order here. So last week we asked the mayor about the housing um, transmittal. She said it was, it was forthcoming and we're just, I, we're wondering where we're at with that. It's a you know, it's a priority for us this year, and we want to jump right into that and make sure that Salt Lake City has the, the proper policies in place to set for housing. Uh, and I think Councilman Johnston had the same question. Uh, that transmittal is on its way. It got to my office on Friday. We'll get it to you so you can discuss it on the August 9th meeting, if that would work for you. Okay. Great. Was that your same question, Andrew? No. It's a good okay, question. Yeah. He, he Patrick, that, that was a good guess. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> you have that question that had been answered. I'll go to question number two. Uh, is there an update from the administration on the algae bloom and contamination? There is, and I uh, am going to ask Laura Briefer, our public utilities director, to come up and give the update. Uh, we are on top of it. Uh, Laura and her team have been doing a tremendous job uh, keeping us advised, but uh, she can speak uh, better for herself here. Laura, welcome. Could you, you just tell us, uh, give us your title and as your introduction? Sure. Um, Laura Briefer, uh, Director of Salt Lake City Public Utilities Department. Um, so just a, an update on the toxic algae bloom, or actually the more technical term is the harmful algae bloom, or the HAB. And, um, and so we had, um, this, was, this, actu this issue was actually discovered on Friday last week. Um, where there were some elevated levels of this, um, ha this harmful algae bloom discovered in Utah Lake. Um, the state uh, Utah County Health Department closed Utah Lake to public recreation and use because of this. And, um, and just to back up a little bit, this harmful algae bloom is harmful because um, exposure to both the bacteria involved in the bloom 
and potential toxins released by this bacteria um, could cause health impacts to, um, to people, animals. Um, and so, so it's really a public health concern. Um, and so as uh, the weekend unfolded and additional investigation and sampling occurred by um, the various health departments, by the State Devar Department of Environmental Quality, um, we started realizing that this harmful algae bloom could be more wide-reaching across the valley. Um, some samples have detected some elevated levels within the Jordan River, um, so precautions have been taken throughout the Jordan River in, the Salt Lake, in Salt Lake County and in Salt Lake City to um, restrict access, um, post warning signs at public access areas. Um, and in terms of um, the city, we also, so public utilities manages um, a system of irrigation canals um, as well as other communities in the, on the east side and west side of the Salt Lake Valley that take, can take water from Utah Lake to deliver for irrigation purposes. Um, from the city's perspective, as we started understanding that this, um, these cells might be present within that water, we've actually taken steps um, starting this morning to replace um, that water resource with other sources of water. Um, so various parts of the system now are going to be receiving uh, well water and stream water rather than Utah Lake or Jordan River water. That'll take a few days to transition the entire system to that, to that um, additional water source. Um, I'd like to stress also that our drinking water sources are not impacted by the situation. Well, we have a couple of questions, if you don't mind. Charlie Luke. Sure, I have two questions. So first off, I know that there are a number of tributaries in the city. Uh, that, that feed into the Jordan River, or right. you, is public utilities testing those tributaries as well? Um, so the, the tributaries in the city would include um, City Creek, um, Mel or Parley's Canyon, uh, Red Butte Stream, um, and so those those um, systems. There are n the the Jordan and Salt Lake Canal would be the discharge point for Utah Lake water into those systems. Anywhere that the Jordan and Salt Lake discharges to those systems, it discharges to that part of those streams where they become piped. Okay. Um, ex with the exception of Liberty Pond, which may have received some mixture of Utah Lake and other water um, as it's connected to that, that part of the system. Um, we closed the, um, the area where that uh, Utah Lake water could get into Liberty Park Pond, um, but we're testing that and the, the testing is actually being conducted tomorrow when the laboratories can take those samples. Okay, thank you. And then uh, the second question, I know that Rose Park Golf Course and Glendale Golf Course uh, use either canal or uh, Jordan River water as secondary water sources. Right. Have we switched over to culinary on, on those courses or are we still using the River water. Uh, yes, uh, so Lisa Schaefer and I have been working closely together on this, and um, I understand that the um, courses that use secondary water have switched over to culinary water. Okay. So we've been working with them on that. Thank you. Sure. A couple other questions. Derek Kitchen. Hi, Laura. Hi. Um, mm -hmm. Can you help me better understand what caused this algae bloom? Sure. Um, so, so first of all, there is a, a ton of information on potential causes for this on the State Devar Department of Environmental Quality website, and there's a lot of work that's being done to identify um, causes and impacts and duration of the impact. Um, my understanding is uh, there are a number of conditions that need to be in place in order for this type of algae to grow. And one of them is warmer water temperatures, um, still water, so water that doesn't have a lot of movement in it, um, and, um, and just a lack of sort of mixing of the water, like with wind or storms or anything like that. And also Utah Lake is at historically low levels right now too. And all of those conditions contribute to an algae bloom like this. Oh, and one more, there's also um, uh, the potential for nutrients to come into the water, waterway too, so nitrogen and phosphorus that are typically found in um, agricultural and urban runoff, sometimes wastewater treatment plant runoff too. Would you attribute this to local um, 
Would, is this global warming? Is this our so <laughs> local experience with global warming? So, th so a, a water quality incident such as this is actually something that um, if you look at the impacts of climate change um, with increased air temperatures and the possibility of increased minimum water temperatures, um, this could be something that is attributable or a situation like this would be attributable to effects of climate change potentially. So how do we brace for this uh, going forward? How do, we, what, uh, do we need to make um, systemic changes or is there something that we can <coughs> do to, any investments we need to be making? Can you um, speak to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there, um, there's a concept of integrated water management um, and, and that's really you know, tying together this um, water supply, water quality, um, scenario planning for, for climate change or climate variations. Um, and, and so I think there are a number of strategies to prepare for something like this or to adapt or to be more resilient. I think one strategy that the city has in place right now, watershed protection, um, is, is, a, is a big strategy for us that could be translated across the system. Um, and, and, you know, I think, I think the group, the community really does need to come together and look at cause and effect and the policies in place um, to, and, and sort of the technical, the technology behind it too. Um, to <coughs> assess what can be done in the future. I think we've, we're learning a lot of lessons from this. Thank you. So. Andrew Johnson. Uh, yes, he said that it does not affect the drinking water currently no. in Salt Lake City at all? No. Okay. Um, fishing and farming off the river, the folks who are doing that, uh, right. if that did not affect it, how much? So the... the um, State Department of Agriculture has issued some warnings to the agricultural community um, in terms of application of this water on to crops and produce in particular. Um, and there's also there have also been some uh, warnings and cautions with, with related to fishing. Okay, so don't fish. Um, maybe don't eat the fish. <laughs> don't eat the fish. <laughs> and that'd be advisable um, and, at this point. <laughs> well, and, and, and one of the interesting um, si issues with this situation is there's still a lot of research that's being done on impacts, public health impacts. So, um, you know, I know that the State Department of Environmental Quality, the State Department of Agriculture, and the local health departments are all kind of combing through research to better understand sort of the impacts that we might be facing. Um, there hasn't been a lot of research, so we've been taking very precautionary measures because our, our first goal is to protect public health. And, and may I add, Councilman and Council, uh, we are uh, notifying people along the river, the homeless people living along the river, as well as the refugees who may be fishing uh, right. for food for mm -hmm. their families. We're notifying them uh, about this uh, aggressively, hand to hand, uh, face to face, and using our networks to get the word out to the communities that we think might not get the word out through regular channels. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just to follow up to that, yeah. does that include um, individuals who have property rights to the Jordan River? I know that in District One, there there are very few that actually have rights to pull water out of the Jordan River. Have we notified them? Uh, I don't know that the answer to that, but we'll find out. I don't okay. know that I have a list of of those individuals too. And and um, I do want to add that Salt Lake County um, has um, stood up its Joint Information Center, and so questions like that, how we get information out to people that might be pulling water. Um, you know, there's been a lot of media on this, but some individual context could be helpful mm -hmm. too. Thank you. Any additional? Yes, Aaron Mendenhall. Um, we don't know much about it. It sounds like at least enough that we can forecast, but is there a time frame we're looking at for reopening to the pond or um, clearing water? Any ideas that way? So for, for Liberty Pond, mm -hmm. um, there's, there is no longer any Utah Lake water that's entering there, and we're able to flush that, and we're, we're actually flushing that part of the Jordan Salt Lake Canal today and tomorrow okay. with other water sources, and we'll be collecting a sample tomorrow and there's about a two day turnaround time so we'll know for sure. Um, the good thing about Liberty Pond is it's aerated uh, as well so the water is moving in that system um, so that's, that probably protects it too. How about the overall um, system? The, the overall um, algae bloom situation, that's, that's a question we all have all over the Salt Lake Valley. Um, 
At this time, it doesn't appear that the bloom has dissipated, um, but you know, weather conditions can really affect that. Unfortunately, the weather forecast uh, for the next week um, doesn't have any weather system moving into it. And so from, from our perspective, we're gearing up for you know, having this, um, managing this event and situation for the next couple weeks and maybe longer. So we're, we're planning for a longer event potentially. Uh, one thing, not for Laura, actually, but for the administration with the refugees who find food by fishing in the river, and um, it's, it is, I know, understand, not necessarily a direct path to get those communications to that population, but uh, in doing so, I wonder if we might be able to um, offer some sort of food subsidy in the meantime, that this is a, a very real piece of, of diet for a piece of our population and whatever assistance, temporary relief we could um, offer them in terms of that, that food source, I think would be a smart move for us to pair that communication and see how we can complement that need. Thank you, and we will do that. That's a great suggestion. Thank you. Thank you, Laura, and thank you, Patrick, um, for those updates. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And are there uh, any additional questions for Patrick, uh, representing the mayor? <laughs> Thank you. So before we move on to our next item of comments, I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that we have a group of visitors with us today, and I'd like to invite Robert Lockett to move, come up to the microphone and tell us a little bit about it. But we have a group of uh, law students who are visiting from Moldova, and uh, they're spending a couple of weeks here looking at our judicial system. And uh, could you tell us, welcome, Robert, and tell us a little bit more about the program. Well, members of the council, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Robert Lockhead. I'm the deputy director of the Lovett Institute for International Development. This is an NGO that uh, contracts with an agency of the U.S. State Department to promote uh, rule of law initiatives in Eastern Europe, but particularly in the Republic of Moldova. Uh, using volunteer lawyers and uh, judges. We teach a two-semester class there in U.S. Uh, trial practice at six universities and their National Institute of Justice. At the end of the school year, there's a mock trial competition and participants in there go through an inner process and we had 21 of them that were selected to come to the U.S. and Canada for a three-week internship. We're fortunate to have nine of those interns with us in Utah for three weeks. They're the beginning of their second week now. So they are observing trials, meeting with judges, other government officials. This is their first experience seeing city government work. And they are learning how the US system works. And uh, as they are rising stars in their home country, hopefully they will take uh, some of what they learn here and, and implement uh, positive changes in their homeland. So thank you for the warm welcome that uh, you have uh, afforded our people. And could you have them stand? I mean, normally we would torture them and ask them to come up and introduce themselves, but we won't do that And tonight. I should also mention we have two of our uh, staff of people here who are husband and wife attorneys from uh, Ukraine. So uh, we'll have, have you uh, stand up, uh, Scott and Ksenia. These are as fine a group of young people as you will ever meet. Welcome. We are thrilled to have you join us, and I know that our meeting is absolutely riveting. Um, so thank you for uh, attending. Yeah, I just I have a comment. Uh, thanks for being here, and I just wanted to note that I'm really happy to see so many women, females, over here. That's great. I, I'd love for you know I'm excited to see what you do back in Moldova, and uh, I think we need more female leaders all over the globe, and so it's exciting to see you here. I think that was him encouraging you to run for a political office, is what <laughs> I heard there. So, We'll now be moving on to comments to the City Council. This is the opportunity for anyone to make uh, two-minute comments to the City Council. Again, I will remind you that we want to respect um, all individuals and their perspectives, so please no applause, um, booing or jeering or cheering, um, and uh, please uh, make uh, every effort to uh, uh, ensure that people feel comfortable in their presentation. Our first card is from Douglas Gotant, followed by Cindy Cromer. Well, I'm going to have to tell you that this this discussion about the algae should should be handled in your work session. And I'm also going going to say that uh, 
uh, I have had some problems over at the new brand, and I uh, sent uh, reports to the city council and to uh, Mr. Hitchens. Apparently, the, a few days ago, my landlord uh, yelled at me, and he and he was so loud that uh, that apparently a few other people heard him or heard him yelling at me. And I contacted housing, or I wrote a note to housing about it, sent one to you folks, and I was I was wondering if you could uh, go into this and possibly investigate the possibility of uh, talking with housing and getting together uh, with some other groups to have Mr. Crawford fired and also to have Gino, the owner of the Royal Eatery restaurant, soon to become the Apollo Burger, have him fired and, uh, and have the New Brand Hotel put under, under new management because I am getting tired of being yelled at. So tired that uh, I'm thinking about moving out of state. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Cindy Cromer followed by Senator Karen Main. I'm back. I'm still Cindy Cromer. I avoid repeating myself because if I do, children think I'm getting old, which is true. And adults think that I'm tiresome which is probably also true. My comments tonight are revised versions of my remarks that I made in 2019, I'm sorry, we're not there yet, 2013, regarding development rights and development agreements. I risk being identified as old and tiresome tonight because there are three proposals headed to you for decisions which have referenced possible development agreements. This is astonishing. I can never think of one point in time where we've had three development agreements under discussion. Moreover, they're all in historic districts. Two of them are in the South Temple District and one of them is in Central City. Um, the fact that all three are in city historic districts creates an additional hazard in using development agreements, one that I did not address in 2013. So in 2013, I argue that the pressure for development agreements is an indication that the zoning ordinance is not delivering what we want. If you must enter into development agreements, they are less bad when they address issues determined at the time of construction, such as density or height, rather than ongoing use. Ones related to use are the nose of the camel in the tent, and that is number two on your list from 2013. Now, with three proposals in the historic districts, I'm adding another concern. As you can tell, I worry about everything. And that is that a development agreement can actually undermine the authority of the Landmarks Commission regarding height, mass and scale, and setbacks if not drafted with extraordinary care. In other words, your development agreement can become like a new base zone that, that conflicts with the overlay zone or the historic preservation zone. And as specified in the Central Community Master Plan and the Preservation Plan, the mismatch between the adopted zone and the overlay zone is highly problematic. But now I'm repeating a comment from earlier this year, and so I'm really going to stop. But thank you, and I do hope that you will draft any development agreements with extraordinary care. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Uh, Senator Karen Main, and, and the Senator's card is the last card I have, so if there's somebody else who would like to address the council, if you could raise your hand, a staff member will contact you. Mayor. Please. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you. I came a few months ago and asked your help on busing for the county and for Salt Lake City, and thank you very much, it's worked. We have more bus routes, and I think they've got it now. Uh, they call me every time they put a bus route in, so thank you so much for your help. Uh, I hope in front of you, you have a resolution. Um, I'll tell you the history of this. I produced a resolution, uh, and it was passed in the legislature about Utah workers and Utah firms building the prison, and that passed. And the procurement officer tells me that is a tool for them for procurement uh, for those construction companies and those workers in the prison. We, you know, Utah jobs, we're gonna build something. 
And so this is, you have dominance over the airport, and uh, this legislation I'm going to produce to my colleagues, but it won't be until the first of the year. I have no doubt that it will pass. And your procurement is a, uh, is a different umbrella, and uh, I was advised to come here by procurement because you are bidding all the time now. So it's the same legislation it says, work in the airport uh, is encouraged to um, be done by Utah workers and Utah firms. So um, I'm going to run this in January. I hope that you will look at this and if you feel that there's something you can do as a council because you have dominance of, of this. Um, if there's any questions, I would be open to that. Thank you, Senator. I, I, I would ask for a follow-up from our council staff, because I believe several years ago, in particular around the theater, we did draft some language around procurement and uh, preference uh, shown to local firms, but if we could do some follow-up on that, that uh, would be greatly appreciated. I, I appreciate that, and this is dear to my heart. There's so much construction, and I think we need to have Utahns working. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. That was my final card. Is there anyone else here who would like to address the council? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to our um, item E, new business. We're looking at item E1. It's an ordinance. Yes, council member uh, Luke. I move that the council adopt the ordinance amending various sections of the city code to reflect the correct department names in conjunction with the changes made during the adopted annual budget. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion to the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. We're on to item number two, 911 dispatch software. I move we adopt. I'd be looking for a motion to adopt the agreement uh, for the interlocal. Mr. Chair, I move the council adopt a resolution authorizing the approval of an interlocal cooperation agreement between Salt Lake City Corporation and Salt Lake County with respect to the county's transfer of $3,750,000 to the city for the purpose of financing. This is the wrong mm -mm. interlocal. Yeah. I'm going to stop there. That's why I stopped. Uh, and I'm thinking we may not have a motion sheet on this particular one, but we just need to uh, uh, look at a motion to approve the interlocal agreement concerning 911 dispatch software. And, and that's exactly right. You should also suspend the rule probably since this is the first time it's so I be chair. Yes. I <laughs> move we suspend the rules and adopt the interlocal agreement with, South, uh, with the Salt Lake County and Salt Lake City for the 911 dispatch. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion to the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Thank you. Uh, now I'll be looking uh, to Council Member Mendenhall for uh, unfinished business item number one, an interlocal agreement. Instead of finishing my sentence, I'll start it over. I move that the Council adopt a resolution authorizing the approval of an interlocal cooperation agreement between Salt Lake City Corporation and Salt Lake County with respect to the county's transfer of $3,750,000 to the city for the purpose of financing highway construction, reconstruction, and maintenance projects for or for financing enforcement of traffic laws. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion to that motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries, it's unanimous, thank you. Item number two, housing trust fund loan, uh, trust fund loan North Temple Flats. Mr. Chair, I move the council adopt a resolution authorizing a loan from the Salt Lake City Housing Trust Fund to North Temple Flats LLC for the North Temple Flats project. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion to the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. There's aye. one a dissenting vote. That's uh, Council Member Mendenhall. Uh, the motion carries. Uh, item number three, Housing Trust Fund Grant. Mr. Chair. I move that the council adopt a resolution authorizing a grant from the Salt Lake City Housing Trust Fund to the Community Foundation of Utah for the low wage worker pilot program. Second. Uh, there's a motion and a second. Any discussion to the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries and it's unanimous. Um, our remaining item of business is our consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I move the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and a couple of seconds to uh, approve the consent agenda. We'll go with Council Member Mendenhall. Any discussion? 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. We are now officially adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>